Good evening. Welcome to Last Orders with me, John Shires, and our two politicians. Coming up on tonight's programme, cash crisis at the chalkboard. Head teachers say there isn't enough money for schools, but is that really the case? And the new team in town, the independent group of MPs created last month, but they're not a political party, so can they have any influence? Well, joining me this evening are Diana Johnson, the Labour MP for Hull North, and Kevin Hollenrake, the Conservative MP for Thirsk and Moulton. Good evening to you both. But first, inevitably, and with many apologies, to Brexit. And we should be preparing for exiting the EU in about a week and a day. But now we're looking down a much longer barrel to possibly the end of June. 14 weeks and three days, to be precise. Well, last night, the Prime Minister addressed the nation. She blamed the delay... At the feet of MPs. You, the public, have had enough. You're tired of the infighting. You're tired of the political games and the arcane procedural rows. Tired of MPs talking about nothing else but Brexit. So, Kevin, it's all your fault. Was she right? <laughs> well, I think she's got a point, you know, and it's what I hear on the street, uh, back in the constituency on the doorstep, that people are sick of this and they want to move on and, and deliver on, on the decision that, was, uh, that people made on the 23rd of June 2016. Uh, that's what the Prime Minister wants to do. Her deal is a fair deal. It meets the promises that were made, I believe, before the referendum, that we would control migration, that we would control our money and our laws, but we would continue to have a free trading relationship with the European Union. Her deal does this. Colleagues on either side of the house should support it. Diana Johnson, is she right? MPs to blame? No, I don't think MPs are to blame. I think uh, the Prime Minister has been in charge of the negotiations for the last two, 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 odd, two odd years. I think it, you know there's been delay after delay. Um, when finally the Prime Minister came to Parliament with a deal, it was a deal that we'd had no say in. There was no opportunity for Parliament to express a view. And then she wanted us just to vote for what she brought back. And that's not how Parliament works. Parliament is there to scrutinise, to ask questions. We don't just rubber stamp what the Prime Minister says. And I think it's really dangerous for the Prime Minister to try and pitch members of Parliament against the general public. We are there trying to do our job as members of Parliament. And it's just very sad that the, we have a Prime Minister with a very tin ear. She can't hear that Parliament... We are desperate to do a deal, but we need to look at options. We're not satisfied that the deal that she's negotiated is the best deal and does deliver on the promises that were made to my constituents in 2016. So in your view, what's going to be the effect of her speech... And, of course, what she said at Prime Minister's questions yesterday, she accused the Commons of indulging itself over Brexit, contemplating its own navel. Do you think it's going to be counterproductive? It's really dangerous because, um, along with many MPs, I've had people call me a traitor. Uh, along with the other MPs in Hull, we, we had postings on Facebook saying that we should be shot and hanged for, for our approach to Brexit. This is dangerous territory to pitch MPs against the public. The Prime Minister is the leader of this country country and she should be leading us. She should try to bring us together, try and find a way through this, not behave in the way that she has. I have to say, I, I called for her resignation mm. yesterday because I just thought she, she's lost the plot, really, at this really crucial time for our country. She's lost the plot, Kevin? I don't accept that at all. And uh, there's no way of justifying any of those things no. that have been said to Diane. It's mm. absolutely disgraceful that people would take that view. And it's, and it's I can understand where the MPs have a decision to make, it's not an easy decision to make, but as far as I can see, what Labour are asking for is continued frictionless trade and including a customs arrangement um, and access to the single market. That's what her deal delivers. So what the frustration is when you have a deal on the table that you could vote for, go through the lobbies next week on Monday or Tuesday, whenever it is, and move on from this so we can move on to the next phase of the negotiations, that opportunity is available now to all MPs. And I think it's understandable that the Prime Minister is frustrated that, that Parliament, on both on our parliamentarians on our side of the House and on the other side of the House, are simply trying to frustrate this the deal, uh, frustrate Brexit uh, uh, through blocking this deal. And I don't think I, I want to frus frustrate bro uh, Brexit. What I want to do is actually listen to the father of the House, Ken Clark, who's a Conservative, who's saying to the Prime Minister very clearly, let Parliament have some indicative votes. Let's see where there is a consensus in Parliament so we can get a deal done. And I think if we were allowed to do that, then we would reach a, a, 
a point where there was a clear view about what's acceptable, be it the Norway option or some other option. But I do think that we might be able to get there. Norway well, Clark supports this deal. That's the mm. point. Uh, yes, He's willing to he look at other options, but yes. he supports this deal. But the well, pro that's fine, but the rest of Parliament isn't supporting it, and there's a problem mm. we need to address. We'll talk about indicative votes in a moment, but but could it? you're both from constituencies that actually voted leave in the referendum. Could it possibly be that what she said, you don't like it, but it struck a chord with the general public? Well, it, it could be. I mean, she's obviously taken a gamble on that. She obviously feels that by um, uh, complaining about Parliament uh, and going to the people and saying that she's on their side, that might work for her. The problem for her is, though, she needs Parliament to vote for her deal. So by actually taking that step, I don't think that's really mm. helped her case. So what is the remedy? A series of indicative votes? Well, the remedy, the best remedy, is the deal that's on the table. So vote, vote that through next week. If, if that doesn't happen, Parliament, as Diana said earlier, will probably have to look at what it, it is in support of. It's no good just saying we don't support this deal. I fear that if we don't support this deal, what we'll end up with is a much, much softer Brexit, a Norway plus plus, which is being members of the single market, which includes free movement of people, and members of customs union, so it rules out having an, an independent trade policy. That's probably the outcome that will happen. It's much more likely to be that than it is no deal. Would that be after a series of indicative votes? Potentially, is that yes. what MPs actually want? I, I think some do. The, the, you know, in, on, my, on my our side of the fence, the majority want the meaning vote to go through, the Prime Minister's deal to go through. But there's going to have to be some compromise. And I think most MPs are up, are up for some compromise. If we can get to a point where we can agree on something. But I think next week, importantly, we need to make sure that we don't crash out uh, ne next week on the on the date that's been uh, set out. We need to do, stop that happening. Now, what happens on, on Monday or Tuesday when we have this meaningful vote? I think the Prime Minister's not going to win. And I do think then we need to move to indicative votes and make sure that we don't crash out at the, the end of the week. OK, let's move it on slightly, Kevin Hollenrick. Um, can Mrs May survive another defeat if, as expected, she is defeated? Is it three strikes and she's out? Uh, yes, she can survive uh, another defeat. I mean, wh what does a change in leadership uh, solve. You know, the, the difficulty in Parliament is not the leader. The difficulty in Parliament is not a majority for anything in Parliament. All the options so far that Diana's talking about, Norway, have already been defeated in Parliament. Second her, vote's been de people's Kevin, votes been defeated in Parliament. Her style that of leadership, her tinea, her inability well, to your, be flexible. That's your judgment. Most well, people I speak to don't feel that way about it. I've never come across a, a Prime Minister who's so unable to listen to what's being said to her, to react, to be flexible, to, to make deals. She can't. It's but, her way on no in way. my experience, when you go and see the Prime Minister, she does listen. Well, that's but good. You've been able to see the Prime to... Minister. I've never well, been invited I, I, to see the Prime Minister. I'm sorry if you asked her. I'm sure she would see you, Diana. I think your leader actually walked out of talks yesterday. He didn't want, he didn't want to see Chuka Aruna well, there, which think, seems ludicrous. I think the key thing is now we all need to be working together. We need to sort this out for the good of the country. I'm I agree sure with we that. agree on totally this. Right. Uh, but I just think the Prime Minister is certainly not helping with this style that she has of inflexible, intransigent, and it's her way or no way. I've not f I found that with the Prime Minister. I've been to see her about various different things to do with Brexit. She has definitely listened. She doesn't have to agree. She will point out ways she thinks you are wrong. Uh, Diana Johnson, Kevin Honoré just mentioned uh, Jeremy Corbyn walking out of this meeting of party leaders yesterday because Chukar Amuna from the independent group was in, how, in, in this meeting. How does that chime with his, uh, his call for greater cross-party cooperation? Well, it doesn't look very good, does I, it? The one thing I would say is that, you know, for the last two years we haven't had these meetings and we should have been having these meetings much earlier on. The Prime Minister should have been calling all the parties in and having discussions and trying to build a consensus of the way forward. I think that, that just on a technical point, the independent group are not a political party. Um, you know, you could argue that actually they've left the Labour Party, they've set themselves up into this little group. What, what the meeting really needed to be about was the official leaders of the parties at Westminster and particularly, particularly the leader of the opposition because he has a special place in the way that um, this country operates in terms of our constitution. He is the leader of Her Majesty's opposition. He's the one really where the discussion should have been going on for many, many many months beforehand. How re relieved are you that as you watch the Conservative Party tear itself asunder over Brexit that you're not in power because you're just as divided in Labour Party as well, are you? 
I think I think this is a national crisis, and I think that both parties have obviously got splits and people who who want to see Brexit or don't want to see Brexit. I would say that I think the Labour Party at the moment we are committed uh, to trying to build a consensus, and I think that um, it's really sad that the the Prime Minister has been negotiating within her party and not been willing to negotiate across the the House of Commons because I do think there is a real will for a deal to be done on my side of the house. Finally, Kevin Hollerick, on Brexit, how worried are you about this growing disconnect between Parliament and the general public, the voters? Oh, I'm very worried. I mean, I think this is a national failure of the parliamentary process. It's a humiliation. It's absolutely not right that we should be in this position with only a few days to go until we leave the European Union. We agree on that. So we're going to have a lot of work to do when we eventually get past this point to be able to try and restore trust between politicians and the public and that's not going to be easy okay well we might return to brexit a little later on but uh, next to the ongoing controversy over school funding and the head teachers who say the amount of money they're given to provide education is failing the grade some are claiming years of austerity have left budgets at the bottom of the class Earlier this week, school leaders from South Yorkshire went to Downing Street to fight for more cash. But the government says there's more money now going into schools than ever before. Here's David Hurst. Delivering an appeal at the door of number 10. These head teachers from Sheffield, accompanied by some of the city's MPs, were hoping to make themselves heard, with a strongly worded letter signed by more than 170 of their colleagues back home. Earlier, they'd met with the school's minister, Nick Gibb, who they say listened sympathetically to their claims that schools in Sheffield are poorly funded. Elsewhere, schools are also struggling. At Headland School, a comprehensive in Bridlington, it's become a story of survival against a backdrop of budget cuts. Head teacher Sarah Bone says she's been forced to lose almost half of her staff in the last five years. We centralised photocopying, and I know that's something that gets brought up as a means of saving money, but actually that, that is immaterial in terms of the big cost of actually losing so many support staff as well as teaching staff. Um, and it has meant I've obviously had to ask staff to do more in the little time that we already have with our young people. Her job, she says, made more difficult by an historical funding formula where a school like hers receives £4,250 a year per pupil, compared, for example, to Tower Hamlets in London, which gets around £8,500 per pupil. The Education Secretary, Damien Hines, has told head teachers he is hearing their message loud and clear, and he's pledged to make the strongest case possible for education to win more funding from the Treasury. While today the Department for Education says there's more money than ever before going into schools. But nowhere near enough, say head teachers. They claim between three and six billion pounds is required if schools are to provide the kind of education pupils deserve. Well, Kevin Honoré, head, head teachers, parents and governors say, yeah, there's a school funding crisis. The government says, oh, no, there isn't. Which camp are you in? Well, I suppose the good news that isn't reflected in your piece then is there are two million more children in good or outstanding schools since 2010. So most children are getting a better education in our system at the moment. There's no doubt there are funding pressures. I used to be the governor of a state school. My kids go to school in North Yorkshire. No doubt there are funding challenges. They have now managed to balance the books. That's easy more school and similarly at Malton. So good head teachers like the one you interviewed in your piece are managing to deal with this, but there's no doubt at all that there are funding pressures. But it's fair to say also that we spend a greater proportion of our, our, our economy, our GDP, on education than any other nation in the G7. So generally, schools are well funded, but it's been a difficult period that we also need to tackle the fairness of funding. As you absolutely pointed out in your piece, schools in my area get about £4,500 per pupil. In Leeds, they get £6,000 per pupil. It's simply not right. It needs to be a much fairer formula. In your view, Diana Johnson, how deep is this cash crisis? 
I think it's very deep and when you realise that over 5,000 teachers are no longer in the classroom, have lost their jobs, I think it's about 2,500 teaching assistants have gone. We know that special educational needs, there's a real crisis there and it just seems to me so short-sighted that we are not investing properly in our schools because we know that investing in education is the best economic policy that a government could actually pursue. So I am, I am really concerned but I'm also concerned about teachers and about the morale of teachers and we've got some great great teachers in our classrooms and great head teachers, but how long they will carry on when they're under such pressure and feel that they're not being valued. And yet we do, as Kevin Holland was saying, we spend more per pupil on education than countries like Germany and the United States. But I actually think um, we've got a problem in that we've got schools and, and head teachers who are saying they cannot afford to balance their they can't uh, balance their budgets. They're Isn't that something wrong with the way that they're doing well, it? Well, I think I, I've not got a problem with looking at, at school budgets and the way that we fund things. But I think overall there is a problem when we've got children who are not getting access to the kind of say support they needed. They've got special educational needs. That there's a real problem there, and so we have we have to look at this again because it's simply not working. Is the real problem the way the funds are allocated. Why should schools in London, for example, uh, get almost twice the amount of money per pupil than some in deprived areas in our region? Absolutely right. It should be the same. It should not be a postcode lottery. It should be the same wherever you are. A pupil in the, with the same needs should get the same funding. Four and a half thousand per pupil per year in, in Yorkshire, in, in North Yorkshire, six thousand in Leeds, eight and a half thousand as you saw in London. It's not right. The government has has uh, pledged to tackle this and is starting to tackle it through a fairer funding formula. But the spending rounds are tight and it's very difficult to take money off schools. You can only really balance it up over time as more money goes in. More money is going in. It's right that it does. But, the but isn't is this urgent? Shouldn't the, the Education Secretary be addressing this right yes. now? Well, and he, yeah. is, we are addressing that. But as I say, unless you're going to put a huge amount more money in, it's very difficult to take it off schools who are already getting that level of funding. So we need to do it progressively. Of course we want to spend more money on education, but there's only so much money to go around. Well, that's to, not quite true, is it, Kevin? Because right. Kevin, 2001. Because we seem to have found a money tree there making, recently, it's don't making, we? Well, that's not you're making choices <laughs> about where you spend your money. Of course you have to you, make Choices. You make choices that's, that's about giving tax to uh, cuts to, to, the, to the rich, and then you find that schools no, are saying they can't buy that's toilet paper. You know, so it's about choices in politics. Simply not as true. We know. The tax burden well, in the UK is higher than it's ever been, and if you want to raise taxes to put more in education, everybody would be hit by those taxes, not well, just the not rich. That's not the case, no, because that's Labour's put forward case. a policy of how we could have higher taxes on those who earn the most. Your policy for a taxation in your last manifesto for people earning more than hundred thousand pounds was. 73% of that money was through taxation. What what on earth? That was the marginal rate of taxation. That's how, how it works. Well, I, what on I'm, earth incentive I, is there somebody to go out and work on I that basis? I guess I'm a progressive politician Me and too. I think if you earn more you should pay a I little bit more that. in your but, tax. But and that's why, that's why I disagreed with when the government put forward tax cuts for the richest in our society. Okay. The, so. Last year was the first year since 2001 we balanced the books in this country. Two trillion pounds in debt. We've got to balance the books. Okay, I think time's up on this one. We'll have to agree to disagree. Yeah. Now, it's uh, not only Theresa May who who's been having troubles with her own backbenchers. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party was dealt a blow last month when initially seven of his MPs quit to become part of the new independent group. Peniston and Stocksbridge everyone. MP Angela Smith was among those who unveiled themselves at a hastily arranged press conference saying they'd left the fold over dissatisfaction with the Labour leader's stance on leaving the EU and the handling of the row over alleged anti-Semitism. Well, they've since been joined by another former Labour colleague and three MPs who've also resigned from the Conservatives. So, um, have, have the independent group Diana Johnson made any real impact on the political landscape so far? I'm not sure that they have, to be honest, and I'm really very disappointed that Labour colleagues, good Labour colleagues, felt the need to go off and, and form this independent group. I think if, they, if they've got the, the will to start a new group off, then they should have had the will to stay and fight within the Labour Party for what they believe in. So I'm really disappointed that we've, we've ended up with this schism, and obviously we've got Conservatives now joining that, that group of Labour MPs, so I'm not really quite sure uh, what their policy platform will be be because there seems to be a real mixture in there of um, Labour and Tories with different views on lots of things. I mean, I think the common denominator is probably Brexit at the moment mm. in that they're holding together on the second referendum. But 
other than that, I'm not really sure what they're going to be saying. You've lost three MPs. Uh, are they a threat? Well, uh, it's, it's, no, it's not good we lose any MPs. Less, I think, than the Lib Dems, it's, isn't it? It's not good we lose any MPs. We want them back. You know, I think the one thing I would say today, and it's absolutely true that we're divided on Brexit, the country's divided on Brexit, and that's driven this schism in our own party, and that's why, uh, more, than, more than anything, we've, we've lost these three members of Parliament for now. I do think the Labour situation is slightly different. There's quite a number of issues there, anti-Semitism being one, economic policy being, being the other, the differences of view on how you run the economy between the front bench and lots on the back benches. That was definitely a case, and Brexit. So I think our situation's a, a little bit better than perhaps Labour's. We're divided on one thing. If we get this resolved, hopefully those three MPs will come back into the fold. But traditionally in a general election, voters do stick with the two main parties. But uh, voters, as we've already discussed already in the programme, they're heartily sick at the moment. So, so could the next next election do you think be different? It could be. I think people have uh, lost a great deal of faith in politicians. Uh, we need to do it completely different in the next election in many different ways. But you know, we, need to, we need definitely to demonstrate as we move forward to the next phase of the negotiations, assuming we get this deal through next week in a much more constructive fashion. I don't disagree with Diana. We need to do it more cross-party, work more closely in how we deliver this together so that we can run the country properly together rather than simply fighting it out in Parliament. That it is such uh, an appalling way to deal with things. Uh, the, the, the situation we've got in right now is not the one we need to be in. Donna Johnson? Uh, well, in 2017, of course, the two big parties took the majority of the vote. They really were squeezing out any of the, the smaller parties. So uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the next general election. I don't know whether there will be this upsurge of independent parties or independent groups that might come forward. I, I really don't know. OK, at we'll stage. see. Finally, back to Brexit. We're back with last orders on April the 25th. Five weeks. Where are we going to be? We've got 10 seconds each. Everything sorted and we'll come out on June the 30th, out with no deal, still in limbo. Dana Johnson. Well, we've got to wait and see what the EU say about uh, any extension and whether that's agreed, but potentially we could still be negotiating uh, up, up until the 30th of June. Kevin Hollenrake, everything sorted, out with no deal, still completely in limbo. Everything sorted. We're, we're left with a deal, hopefully the Prime Minister's deal, um, but we will... I don't believe we'll leave with no deal. I think that would be very bad for business and I think we'll come to an agreement, finally, where we leave uh, in an orderly fashion. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, that is it for tonight. Thanks again to both my guests. We are back next month on April the 25th with all the latest news and views from Westminster. Who knows what might have happened by then from all of us here. Good night. <laughs>